we have a wonderful topic um, called Hot Fuzz, uh, which, you know, I really like the name on there. Um, but uh, what, we'll, what we'll be doing is, is going over fuzzing tools and techniques for, um, for web services. So it should be pretty exciting. My name is Jason Gillum. I am uh, one of the owners of Secure Ideas and CIO. And I would like to introduce uh, Mick Whitehorn Gillum. Yes, he is my brother. Um, and he is um, one of our uh, star, I guess, a front-end web-type hackery background people. So he comes from a background of doing lots and lots of, um, of uh, web app uh, design and development and has been applying that to pen testing now for several years and does a fantastic job with that. So um, I'm going to control the slides and I'll hand the mic over to Mike. Yeah. <laughs> I guess Mick. <laughs> I call him Mike, but uh, but yeah, it's, it's um, he goes by Mick mostly these days, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, but it is short for Michael, just. Uh, yeah. It's just, but there is no K in Michael. So that's how this all happened, right? <laughs> this all happened because I decided, yeah, no, we'll just truncate. We'll substring that sucker right there. And uh... yeah. see, typical software engineer thinking right there. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, then. All right, let's dig in. Uh, so you can just say uh, next slide when you're ready for next slide, and I'll do it that sure. way. That works. <laughs> uh, so, so Hot Fuzz, right? Obviously, um, happens to also be the title of a movie. So I like movies. Um, you might find a couple of little hidden Easter eggy movie references in here. Not many, but but a few. Um, but also obviously talking about fuzzing. Um, and so that really brings us to the next slide because it's a big question. It's an important question. Why do we fuzz? Why do we fuzz? Why we're testing? For security, but also, uh, I mean, fuzzing is applied to a lot of other types of testing as well. Sometimes we are testing for the resilience of an application or a service. Um, we just want to make sure that, if, you know, we, we don't, we're pretty confident we don't have injection flaws, but we don't want to not handle an error properly and have something fall over on us. Nothing um, like users getting that weird error message and like, hey, the application's broken. I don't know why it's not working. <laughs> it, which is probably the, uh, the 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 service now ticket or the Jira or whatever that actually reaches your desk. At which point it's yeah. a well, how did we get here? Well, then one thing, and, and I'm, I know I'm I'm kind of stepping in on on, <laughs> on your presentation here, so, but but bear with me because that's this is actually a factor that because I know a lot of people watching this are, are probably from a software development or part of an organization or or they're working with them. But if yep. you're looking for a justification for learning more about fuzzing, one of them is actual dollar signs on this. Because when customers call in and say, hey, I'm getting this error message, then that ends up being something that ends up taking a lot of time and money to fix. And so that's just pure, like there's a dollar related uh, factor to that, um, which resonates with management when they start wondering, hey, why are you looking at these tools? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And it's, uh, for me, when I think about the testing methodology in general, how, how do we do discovery activities, particularly uh, on an application or, or a web-based uh, service, uh, is one of the primitives that I, you know what I mean by primitives. So like uh, we do primitives in a programming language, they're your most basic data types. They're your, your strings, your integers, your, your, your uh, floats. Really nice. uh, Booleans, yeah. yeah, very simple data types that everything else is, is built up of. Uh, for me, even though it is sort of a derivative of just repeating and tampering a single request, um, for me, fuzzing is, I consider that sort of a primitive. Um, a lot of the other things that we do on top of that, like scan, think about scanning, right? You run some sort of active scanner. Um, that's built on top of fuzzing as, as its foundation. Um, so, so it's it, it really is a core to how you approach testing testing an application or or what, well, I, I, for me I'm focused on web based services today uh, it's a lot of what we do um, but this really does apply to other network technologies as well and uh, even non networked technologies. Well, I mean the term fuzzing even origi originated with um, network testing like you were fuzzing a yeah. network service endpoint that predates the web. So. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Um, so just to standardize on what I mean when I'm talking about fuzzing, um, I, and I think probably I, I recognize a few names in the audience. I, I think uh, a lot of the people here know this already, but just to, to sort of set a, a baseline, um, I'm thinking I have a list of values and I want to substitute them into a request and repeat that request one by one and be able to capture what that resulted in. Um, and that's, I mean, that's really the core of it. So if I have, there, there are lots of different ways you can do uh, combining different word lists and all that sort of stuff. I'm not focused on that today. Right now it is really just, I want to substitute a value from my word list into the request, issue it, grab the next value of my word list, substitute it into the request, issue it, and so on. Um, so so that's, that's, that's sort of the baseline. Uh, why don't we move ahead and <laughs> so fuzzing it. So <laughs> sorry, I pressed what? the button and it wouldn't move forward. I'm like, oh, what's going on? It, okay. well, so that's always worrying, right? Because you're afraid if you're gonna, <laughs> if you press the button again, then it will move forward, but it'll move forward two slides. Two we'll slides. No, it did only go one, so I think we're good. <laughs> um, so so web apps, right? We, we, we fuzz web apps all the time. We've been doing it for ever. Um, as long Pretty as much since there have been web apps. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, fuzzing a web app is easy, right? We, we, we've got tools. We know how to use them. So we have the browser. We run it through our proxy. Uh, it would be Burp Suite or Zap or there are others out there. Um, and the request goes along to the application server. And it does whatever it does behind the scenes and the response comes back through the proxy to the browser. And that's us mapping. That's us using the, the, the application normally. And then when we want to fuzz it, we go to our proxy, we find that request and we put it into whatever the fuzzing tool is called uh, in, that, in, that, in that proxy. Um, set up our word list, set up our substitutions, and then it repeats those variations of the request to the server, nice and easy. You know, um, it's 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 become commonplace uh, at this point, and, and and has has been for quite some time. Uh, but I guess moving forward, uh, web services have come along um, of various kinds, and, and and to be fair, things like like REST is not new, right? We're going to talk about SOAP a little bit today. That's that's not new. Um, no, nope. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it was really cool when it was, um, believe it or not, uh, the web services come along with various technologies, various different kinds. They've, they've got different characteristics. Uh, and then as security professionals, we need to figure out how to fuzz these things. Um, because there isn't necessarily a clear map to how to do that. Um, and so questions come up, what clients are available uh, is cited here. So it's not the browser, if it's a web service that you're directly interacting with. Um, you need to use some sort of client app. You're probably not going to use uh, Netcat and just hand write your, your requests. Mm -hmm. um, Curl. <laughs> uh, in, in some cases, yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, if, it's, if it's based on HTTP, that may be a valid uh, option, and it, it may, in some cases, be your better option. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess one one example just to throw one out there of something that's, um, like a more modern one that once once this type of web service came out here, uh, a lot of of application pen testers kind of went, huh? How are we supposed to test this thing? As GraphQL, right? Like that's yep. that's it's newer and it's a uh, hmm. What, what do I do with this thing? It's it's different. It doesn't follow the same patterns that I'm used to. So, yeah, yeah, and, and so that ends up being we've we've had conversations about that. Um, certainly with clients, even because GraphQL to me seems fairly well established. But even within the last year, we have a conversation with a client we we haven't uh, tested for before, and they are they're concerned whether or not we know GraphQL because maybe we don't. Um, based based on their past experiences, so 
Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes, we do. Yes. Yes, we know GraphQL. Uh, yes, the, the two people on this call have actually implemented a fair bit of stuff in GraphQL. Uh, so, sorry. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, we know it. Um, but yeah, we had to go back. Well, the tools that we were using didn't work. We were used to using Postman at the time for, for REST um, when, when GraphQL really took hold. And at that point in time, Postman didn't support it. It, it does today, but but Postman has also gone off in a different direction. We'll touch on that a little bit. I'm not going to go too far into it today. Um, but so what that brings us to is really it's a there. Let's move ahead to the next one. Um, we need to find some. We we need to have some sort of systematic approach of I don't know how to fuzz the thing the the in this case specifically the web thing. Um, semi-specifically, I guess. Uh, so how do I go about working out a solution to that problem? Uh, and so the first four points there really are kind of taking an inventory of what is available to you, right? You're, you're, you're listing your assets, right? That doesn't have a standardized service descriptor. What do I mean there? I, it lists something like a, like an open API spec or a swagger file. Uh, what that is to rest, GraphQL has a schema, you know, and so on. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk or, about it. Or for those of you who are more old, yeah. old school. So, <laughs> yeah, web service definition language, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you see, yeah, one of those, is there a web app in play? If, 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 if there's already a web app that implements all of your API interactions, why didn't you list that among your assets, right? Um, that was a that that that's a useful I think Jason just realized that's why the wheel brows there. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was the way that you said that. For those who haven't caught it, it is a princess bride reference. <laughs> yeah. Um, because because you you've already provided a client, already works with the proxy we already have that issues the requests. Right. If if it truly does cover the surface of your API, that's probably enough to set up fuzzing. Right. Um, are there other client apps available? I'm thinking like desktop apps there. What other tooling exists in the ecosystem that is out there? Libraries, packages, somebody's sketchy Python script, you know. Um, and then and then there are I hope there are still five approaches. Um, so there's five different approaches basically to to testing. We'll we'll detail those later. Um, but it's kind of the roadmap of where we're going. Uh, but but again, summarizing those 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 first four points, it really is about it's about taking an inventory of, of the assets, taking an inventory of what you have in the ecosystem around that technology um, that you can leverage to achieve the goal of fuzzing. Because sometimes that that um, that inventory can be extensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Some of the REST APIs out there, and it's like, oh yeah, we have like two hundred endpoints. <laughs> As a mature technology that's been around, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. REST. There's a lot of tooling out there um, around it. Some of it's well maintained. Some of it isn't well maintained, but but still may provide some value. Um, so. Actually, I would say there's there's less tooling around because there, it was a different time, really. And uh, I think when SOAP took off, the attitude a lot of the time was, we're going to develop a tool for this, and it's going to be the one tool for it, and it's going to do it well. And nobody's ever going to need to write another tool for that. And, and, and maybe somebody had a different opinion, and so there were two tools for it. But um, it, it's not like today where it seems like Roll your own library has become very much more commonplace as well. So uh, anyway, that feels like me soapboxing. It's it's it, it's not. It's it's just an observation about the state of things. Um, it's not a not intended to be a, an opinionated negative or positive. Um, let's move on to, to service descriptors in more detail. Yeah. So, it, and this is where. Uh, so these are the four, four technologies, RESTful services you know about. Now, when I say RESTful services, that is typically we're talking about JSON payloads being sent over, over HTTP and using the 
the HTTP methods, your gets, your posts, maybe your puts, deletes, patches. Um, there, there, there's a there's opinionated discussion about what well what's restful, what's not restful within within the development community at times, and it's uh, oh well, you used the wrong method for it. you you used a patch wrong, so it's not restful. Well, for our discussion, it's close enough. Um, yeah. So so don't worry too much about what the specific definition is, other than that this is the web services that you probably uh, are, have, have thought about the most over the last several years and you're most familiar with, unless you're in an organization that is heavily invested in SOAP or GraphQL or possibly gRPC. Um, I, I would also argue that that the broader definition of RESTful is what we, like, whether you're being strict about it or taking that more broad sense about it, that doesn't change how we test it anyway. So no, no, so, no, it, it, exactly right. Um, so out of these four examples, and, and they really are examples, there, there are other things out there. Um, but out of these four examples, the only one that doesn't have a mandatory service descriptor is RESTful. Uh, for, 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 for the three other ones, you have to write a service descriptor for it to be that kind of service and for it to work. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but if you want to write one for RESTful, you've got the open API spec. Um, Formerly, because they, they were the ones who popular, popularized it, it was the Swagger. Swagger was the, the name of the format previously. Um, that really has become the standard for it. There are proprietary ones out there. Postman Collection is, is Postman's proprietary format for it. Um, and, and I wrote curl commands there. You can actually do it. You can write a big text file of curl commands. And most tools for working with these types of services will let you import those. So, um, it, it, I would say if you've got, a, if you've got a list of curl commands for, for calling each of your, uh, service endpoints, you have a service descriptor effectively, uh, in that form. Um, so if you've got the WSDL XML thing that describes how to interact with that service, what, what, what is available to you, what you can call, what parameters, each of those things expect gigantic nor enormous XML file. Um, in preparation for this, I actually did, I, I did a simple like to-do list uh, style API um, and I implemented it with a little help from, from, from an AI. I, I implemented it in, in, uh, in SOAP, uh, in GraphQL and, and I did a, a gRPC implementation. Uh, I think the actual, actually I didn't do very much of a restful one, um, but the WSDL is huge compared to the other service descriptor types. It is much, much larger. So um, LLMs were built on the ability to like, they, they were built out of being tra like translating between languages. Cause so I could totally see how you could take, I didn't, hadn't really thought of that before, but you could take like a, a open API spec or WSDL and say, Hey, I want to create a GraphQL equivalent of this. And it would probably be able to generate it very well. It does. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I, the um, the protocol buffer one was actually the reference implementation in my case because it, okay. was, it was the most concise. <laughs> you could actually take a bunch of curl commands and say, "Hey, build me uh, whatever with that." Like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you I didn't, but I'm sure you totally could. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so the whistles there now. There was a time where it was common, somewhat common, for it to be you'd have a public API, you have a public facing SOAP interface. And you would actually make the whistle available there uh, on the internet. Uh, in my experience with our clients that do use SOAP, uh, even if it's essentially a public API, I mean, uh, authenticated, but but publicly exposed API, um, they don't tend to put the whistles out there to just anybody as often anymore. So it's more likely if we're in an engagement with somebody, we will have to ask for it. Uh, but but it, it 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 exists. If they're doing SOAP services, they have at, at least one WSDL. Uh, depending on how they've organized things, there might be 100 WSDLs or more. Uh, so uh, the GraphQL fills, fills a similar role, uh, the GraphQL schema. But it is it is it is types 
uh, for, for any kind of complex data beyond those primitives that we talked about. Um, and it is it is queries and mutations. That's how things are categorized. So queries, I just want to read something, um, read, read some information back. Mutations for your creates, your updates, your deletes. Um, and, and actually there are subscriptions as well, which are more like, I want to listen for real time updates types of things. Um, I don't see them as often, but we have encountered them, mm -hmm. but that's all described in the schema and that schema always exists. Um, they, they, the server technologies, there's more than one. Apollo is a popular one. Um, I think for a lot of people, that's the reference implementation. Um, but the servers require a schema and the front end counterparts also use a schema. So, uh, depending on how they're set up, sometimes applications actually serve the schema in the front end. Um, if not, they're generating essentially an SDK off of the schema as part of the, the front end build process, but they always exist. If somebody tells you, Hey, we don't have a schema for our GraphQL, they, they're either not doing GraphQL or they're mistaken. <laughs> so. Uh, there it, somewhere it, it exists yeah. now even if i don't have the schema uh it, it is worth noting i can pick apart your front end code and find out how to make all the calls because that that information is there you generated the code for it you served it up um even if the schema is reverse there, engineering yeah it's not super difficult but for us on a pen testing engagement it is a thing that we don't necessarily need to be spending our time on it doesn't deliver i, I would say value. it's a it's a good idea for like if you're asking someone to, uh, your pen testing company to do a pen test for you and you know you have apis on there to get these things ready for them ahead of time yeah because it, it really does help a lot with the quality of the results we always ask for them uh it's it's it, it, if we haven't addressed it before the pre-test kickoff that's always something that's going to come up in the pre-test kickoff yeah Mm -hmm. um protocol buffers again so protocol buffers are the actual uh the service descriptors and dot proto file um similar sort of thing to the to the graphql schema the syntax is, is quite a bit different but uh the, the thing about that one is it is a, a couple of things to, to note about that one because i i assume fewer people probably are um on, on this uh webinar are familiar with the gRPC just because it's 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 not as common to see and it's often used internally for communication between microservices not as often between a you know client and server um and so with those characteristics it's a little bit different it's a little less familiar to people uh so I would say it's a lot less familiar to some people because I don't think I've done a test that's where I've encountered it. I've I've seen it in other places, but not not now. I haven't done as much pen testing in the last uh, couple of years <laughs> yeah. um, as I did previously. So that may be part of the reason for it. But yeah, I it's not something I've encountered very much. No, no, we've encountered it uh, um, as a company a few times, but it's mm -hmm. it's not that common. It's not that did common you, that we're asked to test it. Do you think that there'll be more of it going forward? Like, is it something that's I, being more adopted or? I, I think so. Um, whether we are asked to test it directly or not is 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 a different right. question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because um, as a third party, we often don't have access to all of the inner workings for a yeah. web app test. It's really just the, you know, what's the, the exposed surface of it is what we're... Testing. So if someone someone's got a microservice architecture on Kubernetes, there's a reasonable chance that they select gRPC for the the inter service communication. That makes sense, yeah. But if they have us do a test, that might very well just be from the front to the to the endpoint, and not really digging around the in the internals, yeah. the internals of the cluster. So. Um, but it, it's worth noting; it's an interesting one. Um, the format for that one this. It's going to come up a little bit uh, throughout the next little little bit. Uh, is that that one's actually a binary format when it's in transit? So that's a it's, a it's an interesting point compared to the others, which are all 
technically human readable, uh, depending on how you are with things like JSON. Oh, they're, yeah. XML. JSON and XML, or I don't know what GraphQL, what you would call that exactly, but it's. Uh, yeah, GraphQL is sort of a, it's kind of like a custom query syntax that is yeah. wrapped in a JSON structure normally. So, yeah. Um, so I think at that this point we've we've exhausted service descriptors. Yeah, let's move on. So, is there a web app? And I I, I kind of put put this out there earlier because I, I couldn't I couldn't help myself. Um, so yeah, if you have a web app, I'm gonna repeat I'm gonna repeat it. If, if there's a web app already implemented that uses the whole scope of the the API, or at least the scope that you want to have tested, um, we will discover we'll discover those routes through using the web app, right? Yeah. And this then, is more effort though, right? Like if we typically yeah. I mean you can capture, I guess, uh, in your proxy history, you see some that, of it there. That's what that's what I mean. Yeah. So it, it really depends on how things are organized. If I can filter down to just all the things going to slash GraphQL yeah. in my proxy history, then I'll find them all, right? Or or if it's all under slash API slash user slash whatever. Um yeah that type of that type of uh, restful structure or whatnot um, then it's often I wouldn't consider that necessarily separate from a web app test for already doing a test of that app we should find them all um, and we should I think all of our consultants know that they're supposed to grab those and play with them I, I, <laughs> I, I don't I don't think that I am certain that all of our consultants know that if they're not tampering with those requests, they're not actually completing the test. So yeah. uh, no, that is that is part of it. I mean, define what's in scope and typically all your endpoints yeah. are. Once that's verified, we hammer away at them. Yeah, and, and I occasionally get pulled into internal discussions. These days, I'm often tied up in uh, develop internal development efforts, and so uh, although I was testing. Not that long ago, I still already kind of somebody somebody says they found something interesting on an API. I, I want to jump in and see the show and tell. On of it. course, it's yeah. Like knowledge sharing internally. All right. Uh, so let's, I think we should jump to the next. Yeah, let's move let's forward. Jump. Let's move Go forward. Because this is this is where some things get a little bit interesting. We're starting talking about tools, right? So. Oh, the tools. You see, they matter. They do. Um, so. And this is us working down that list of, of sort of types of assets is, is what we've done here. So we did service descriptors. We did, is there a web app next? Um, other types of clients. So SOAP UI up there, obviously, because uh, if you're doing SOAP, it's not the only one, but it really is, I think, the most established player in that space by a long shot. Yeah. Um, the 800 pound smart bear. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if I'm doing a SOAP test, it, it also does REST technically, but I've never used it for that in a pen test. Um, but uh, but it does support it, which you wouldn't guess from the name probably. Um, but but for SOAP, that's that's for me still my go-to. Um, it does struggle if you've got a lot of WSDLs. Um, it will actually run out of memory. I've crashed it a few times. <laughs> um, but uh, but it, it's it's proxy aware. You can point it at your proxy. Uh, you can bypass uh, TLS uh, certificate validation, which is helpful. Uh, it's um, almost essential, actually, if you're trying to push things to your proxy and see what's going on. Yeah, well, the only alternative is establishing a trust with your with your 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 CA that your your interception proxy is using. Um, so, so so we've got Postman's on the list. Postman's on the list more for. Um, it, I can't Sorry. not acknowledge Postman. Oh, yeah, it's like <laughs> posterity at this point. So Postman, and, and, and I'll keep this short. Uh, they're not wrong for what they did. It's, it's, this is not me saying, oh, they're bad. Um, but so Postman has, has, has moved towards a model where everything is going to the cloud when you're using them. Yeah. Um, and... For them, that's helping them monetize it for developers. They always had sync services for developers to collaborate. Um, we just didn't use them because we didn't want our stuff going to their cloud. Now the cloud part of the offering has become sort of mandatory to using Postman's capabilities, especially things like importing a, a an open API spec 
you can only do on the version of it that is uh, cloud based, cloud cloud integrated, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and, and so for us on a pen test, well, that that's another place we'd be having to send client data, client test credentials all that's right we're not going to we, do that we're not. we try very hard to protect our clients data when we're doing the tests <laughs> yeah anything that says hey yeah can you upload all of this to the cloud no we're not doing that but, <laughs> so we were using it for free we weren't paying like pay, uh, us doing pen tests we were not paying for it so i i, I don't begrudge them for for moving in that direction if it, if it, but uh, it does mean for, for me, it's it's a tool that I used a lot that I don't anymore. You can't use it anymore, yeah. You even did yeah. several uh, blog posts on it yeah. a couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it was like 2018. Or even, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah, um, but where it might still be relevant is for a tester that is internal to an organization that already uses Postman. If, if it's already trusted with your data and access to your, to your dev environments and all that sort of thing, then it may be a, still an appropriate tool for you. Um, Milkman, Milkman is, is uh, so I, I just actually discovered Milkman fairly recently in preparing for this. Um, I've never seen it before, so I'm excited to hear about this. <laughs> yeah, so 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 the, 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 the short version of it, uh just to summarize that it is is the person who wrote uh milkman from the comments i saw on the, on the readme it's an open source uh and it's written in java it's a java fx app um did i just canadianize the java i think i did that <laughs> yeah anyway um so it uh it is written as a postman replacement because of the postman cloud move basically oh, okay the way it's been described. So, so Milkman, has, he said, it's never going to, don't know the person's name and I don't know his pronouns. Uh -huh. um, the developer stated that it will never go the direction Postman went. Um, the cool thing about Milkman is that it's got, it's got imports for proprietary types as well. It's got imports for uh, Insomnia's particular JSON format. I think it's JSON. Uh -huh. That'd be able. But Insomnia's particular format has got imports for uh, Postman collections, um, in addition to Open API specs. But it also does a bunch of other things. It'll do it'll do gRPC. It'll do GraphQL. It will do um, SQL. Actually, I, I, I haven't used that capability, but it, it it's got an SQL mm -hmm. client. Um, so it's pitched as kind of like a a workbench for all sorts of things. Um, my use of it so far has been mostly focused on the, the gRPC part of it, but, uh, I could see it being it, useful for the rest. Yeah. 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 It does, it does a number of things. It's the UI to, to me seems a little unpolished, but, but I would say that probably about every Java desktop application because their UI libraries just don't feel native. Right. Um, but, but. So far, and, and a, yeah, it's it, it it seems seems to be a valid player in the space. Um, Insomnia, I pitched for a while as a uh, at one point as as an alternative option to Postman that you could look at. Uh, it seemed at that point pretty good, but I liked Postman. I was familiar with it, and at that point, it made no sense to switch. Um, my impression is that Insomnia is very quickly headed in the same direction Postman did, and that it's it's backed by by Kong. Kong's the commercial entity behind Kong, them. Yeah, yeah. So. It's also open source or has a chunk of it that's open source components, if I recall. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I actually, well, yeah. I think there were some issues. Some people encountered issues with the um, cert trust in Insomnia as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it may not be from that standpoint. I, I'm not sure whether that's a a bug in, in a particular version of it. But um, and then Altair. Altair was uh, is a is a GraphQL specific one. Um, so mm -hmm. it's good for that. I've heard of it uh, before. I've never used it though. Yeah, it's 
to me, it feels young, which I think makes sense. I believe it's a one dot uh, version that it's on. What's it written in? Do you know? Uh, I don't. I would guess Electron. It's a it's an Electron app. I don't know. Okay. What else they might have behind the scenes? Yeah. Um, but it, but it's uh, and, and I'm not actually certain about it being Electron. So so. Before everyone goes, hey, but Mick said it's electron. It's no, electron. I, yeah. I, I, I think it is. I'm not certain. Yeah. Um, and then just won't go down one by one. Oh, there are only three of them. So I knew Newman's the command line tool that goes with Postman. Um, that still exists for, for executing stuff. That yeah. may have the same caveat on it as Postman. Insomnia has one as well. I can't remember what it's called, though. I didn't check. Uh, curl, we've talked about. Everyone knows Curl. And mm -hmm. GRP curl or GRPC URL. I don't know how to curl. pronounce that. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Uh, so, so that one, and, and I actually I, I use that one a fair bit, and uh, we're going to touch on that a little bit more. But that's that's for GRPC calls, similar to curl uh, for GRPC calls. Uh, let's move ahead. Yes. So I, I mentioned earlier there are these five approaches. And it's a question of finding the one that's going to work for you. For pen testing, uh, these are ordered in about the order that I would like to prefer them. Um, but that's for me. That's for my particular use case. Uh, obviously, if you're doing CI, CD, you're doing some sort of automated testing, then then you're not going to order them the same way. Um, more likely to be either, either your open source tools, number three, or your command line tools, number four. Um, those are probably your better options in that case. So, yeah, um, which ones are better might depend entirely on the particular characteristics of them too. That's going to be part of your listing your assets uh, exercise. Uh, so we'll 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 kind of go in a little more detail into each of those. Uh, so moving ahead to the web based ones, um, we'll just have some examples. So. Uh, you've got, uh, so Swagger UI is out there. Swagger, so that's a hosted and it takes your Swagger file and generates the UI for issuing requests, right? And you, I think almost everyone's seen it. Um, and in a lot of cases, I actually do see Swagger UI instances hosted commonly by clients as well, where they're, they've got, you know, this is our public documentation for our API and here's the Swagger and, it's, and they're integrated. Um, yeah. So. It's it's good for that, um, and you can when you say hosted, you can that can also be hosted locally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can run it on your machine. You you can run it in a container. You can run it. It's not very big inside so. your organization. Yeah, it's good for that. Um, Graphic KO. Note the I in there. That's what makes it different from the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I guess, protocol. Um, uh, so that's is, is essentially a, a, an equivalent for uh, Swagger schemas. Um, so it's cool for that. Um, oh, so both of those have the advantage. You load them up in your browser, you issue requests with them, you capture those in your proxy, and you can use Intruder or whatever you normally use uh, to fuzz. GRPC UE. <laughs> it's just a difficult acronym to... <laughs> um, so that one sort of is, but isn't. Uh, and, and, and the reason why I say sort of in the case of that one is it actually is a front end, not for um, interacting with gRPC services, but for interacting with gRPC URL or oh. GR, gRP curl, curl. So what it actually sends to its server, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't go directly to your service from your browser. It goes from your service, or it goes goes from the front end to its back end, which then issues the curl command. Basically, is what it does. And its payload coming from your front end is not the binary protobuf payload; it is a JSON representation of it, um, which that basically gets translated on the back end and it's yeah. translated on the back. Yeah, um, and so you could use it for fuzzing. But every time you have a translation like that, I think there's a risk that something, instead of you actually testing the service you mean to test, something breaks before it gets there. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, again, it's, it's, it's a sort of, you, you could, you could try a word list through it and have that be the thing that drives GRP curl to, to do that, right. To, to do your fuzzing for you. Um, but I think it does have a caveat. It comes. Yeah. Cause well, you're thinking you're fuzzing through it. So the question is, are you fuzzing the service that's issuing the curl commands or the GR curl, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> or are you fuzzing the actual GRPC service? Exactly. You, know, you might not know. You, like yeah. you might see an error or something show up, but you might not know which of those two was the the source of it. So I, yeah, I could I see what you're saying. Yeah. 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 Which is why I, I think to me I would be hesitant to use it for that. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't ever try it. Um, no. But but I'd be more inclined to use the curl thing directly. Yeah. GRP cool. For fuzzing anyway, yeah. For Other fuzzing. types of testing maybe, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, da, 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 yeah, okay. Um, uh, let's let's move ahead. Desktop so, clients. Desktop clients, and we just named off and went through a bunch of those already. So um, the, the, the key points for those, ideally it should be proxy aware. You don't wanna to have to trick it into going through your proxy. And ideally, I, I don't like messing with my system proxy or having to stuff the client into a uh, virtual machine so that I can get it to proxy. Um, so ideally it's just got proxy settings and it's proxy aware, um, SSL, TLS, compose a challenge. That's specifically that thing I mentioned about certificate verification, um, and Jason pointed out as well. Um, a lot of them have a little toggle box where you can just turn off certificate verification. Uh, Postman did, uh, I think insomnia did or does SOAP UI does Altair doesn't have one of those. Um, right. So I, I found I was able to set proxy settings in it, but. Uh, and isn't, I, isn't that, that a, the verification, isn't that on by default for just about everything? Yeah. <laughs> like that, that's the secure default. Yeah. So this is something you have to consciously remember each time you start a test. Oh, yeah. yeah. You got to <laughs> tear off the certificate verification. It, it, I mean, a lot of them will remember that settings. So they won't turn it back on unless an update causes it to, to flip but yeah yeah so so that's something to know about anyway uh it's it's a if you can't do it easily it's an obstacle um the and, and again the other way to work around it is if you can establish a cert trust which might involve you getting like your putting your your burp ca into your system trust store or something along those lines i don't love that idea either to be honest um although I shouldn't be losing my CA cert out there in the world too often, but uh, I don't know. The idea of adding that there doesn't appeal to me. So, not if I can avoid it. Um, but uh, it, these, you can man manually build requests in like all of these. This is what they're built for. That's their, their primary use case a lot of the time. Um, but being able to import one of those service definitions, those service descriptors we talked about. Um, that's what really makes it worthwhile. It's the, I can pull in my whistle and get all my soap endpoints listed out there or, uh, along with the request structure. I don't have to manually copy from documentation or type out a request. Um, so that's where, that's, that's where a lot of the value is in those. Yeah. Um, reducing errors and speeding things up at the same time. Yeah. Is the, the, the goal I think always is I want to get to what I call the clean request, right? It's the, I want to issue the normal, correct, valid request. That's going to give me a, two, a 200, okay, a, a proper response. Yeah. Um, and I want to get to that as quickly as I can, because once I have that, now I can do actual Fuzzing. testing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anything that helps me get there faster, that's what I like. Uh, okay. Let's go ahead and we'll touch on those. So there are open source fuzzy tools. There are tools out there in the world, um, in the world, meaning GitHub, uh, that uh, have been built for the specific purpose of fuzzing a particular type of service. Some of those are security oriented. Some of them are not really security focused specifically, um, but they've been built for that specific purpose. Um, so, uh, my my examples here: Protofuzz, which is uh, you know the trail of bits. It, it's 
pro specifically for protocol buffers, specifically for fuzzing them, um, written in Python. Um, there's BooFuzz, which is a, uh, it's a now maintained the, I think it's the kind of currently maintained fork of the Sully framework. Um, so that one, it, seems like it could dig into a, even a lot more kind of lower level network fuzzing type stuff um, overall. And Wrestler, Wrestler's out of Microsoft. It is uh, written for REST services. I don't think it even has GraphQL. So it's really kind of that specific. Specific, yeah. Um, but it's got custom grammars. I've looked at trying to leverage it for, 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 for some of the other types uh, of testing and what it would take to do that. But uh, did you run across any that are um, that are specific to GraphQL for open source fuzzing tools? I I haven't seen any, but I didn't look. I don't think. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like we have enough options with, with GraphQL. I guess I didn't think about looking for specifically a, a GraphQL fuzzer. Um, but yeah, no. They they they. I assume might may be there. Uh, often these are not proxy aware, so you're not feeding your proxy with these. You're it's issuing the request and you're logging stuff or you're in in some sort of format that you can review after. Um, yeah, and they can again. It's it's I kind of skipped over it there, but yeah, there's a learning curve on them. Sometimes they take more configuration as well to to make them work with your your particular service. So. That's kind of what knocks them down on the list for me is that extra extra effort to get running. Yeah, extra with effort, yeah. You're almost better right. off going command line in some cases. It's, yeah, if it's simple, yeah. Um, and and uh, of course, being just random open source scripts on the internet, there is the, also the caveat of, of you know look at them, read them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you need you need to understand what they're doing before you run it against a. Uh, system that you're either responsible for or that belongs to your to to in our case our client so um we we code review i think everything everything that's open source we code review before we run it against the client system so uh -huh. um yeah that's i almost forgot i definitely wanted to have that warning on here with the open source stuff but that's <laughs> there there you go there it is so let's move ahead uh command line command line client so there are ton tons i've got two examples there curl and chair curl i did mention newman before as well um oh yeah this is the one that i animated <laughs> uh and so yes they're often better suited to automated use cases such as ci so we talked about that earlier um but curl you might recognize is not a fuzzing tool right it issues a request uh, maybe a few of his following redirects, but it is it is it is doing one thing. And, and GRP curl is the same, um, as you can see there. Now I wrote um, a trusty little node script for fuzzing it that does stuff. It uh, JSON formats the log file. It you know um, it pulls in a word list. It does the substitutions in the command, etc. Um, you can kind of see it there uh in a second right one two three i go too fast there it is um you could use a bash loop you could use powershell you can use python if that's the scripting language you're comfortable with to set up that loop um or go or rust if you really want to like spam the server to death uh, you got some nice high performance options there um it's harder to i was going to say this is similar to writing a custom client really once you once you have to tack extra stuff on there right yeah yeah but it's it wasn't difficult um no. and and so mine is i called it fuzzify it's it's just a generic node file that uh all it does is just takes a command and repeats it substituting a thing and then it captures the the command itself and the output and generates the log um but uh i mean definitely depending on what you're doing you may end up having to, to address things like rate limiting and that sort of thing as well so 
Um, yeah, that's basically a quick kind of rundown of command line clients. I don't think there's anything else really there. I'm running curl in a loop, essentially. It's not uh, yeah. not rocket science. It gets the job done. Um, it's awesome. a little little more work, but not a bad option if you can't get uh, stuff into the proxy. Let's let's talk about custom clients then. Okay. So, because I know that that was the last thing you had, the last type yeah. you had on there. Yeah. yeah, there was the fifth the fifth method. So. Uh, Writing a custom client. So, I mean, it's, it's exactly what it sounds like, right? I'm going to get into my code editor and write a client that does the thing that I need it to do. It could include the fuzzing. It could not include the fuzzing. And I could use a loop like I did on the previous one. Um, but a lot of things have SDK generators, especially all, all the things with the service descriptors. Um, I think all of them have some form of SDK generator. It was the coolest thing with SOAP back in... When did I run across soap the first time? I don't know, 2004 or something like that. Um, yeah. And I was, I, I can't remember whether I was working in Java or, C, or, or, or a really early version of C sharp at that point, whatever, whichever one it was. Um, I think it, I think it had, would have had to be Java. Um, yeah, I could pull the WSDL into, I think it was the IDE, and it would just generate the SDK for that web service. And so uh, it's like the class is everything. It's like, oh, well, okay. And then I just implement that class. And interact with everything that way through normal Java code, which at that point I was certainly more comfortable with than writing XML-based web service calls by hand. So um, it's probably still actually the case. Push comes to shove. Uh, but yes, so bringing that back on, on, on into focus. So SDK generators are, are they're your friend there. So if you have a service descriptor, I think all of them have some kind of SDK generator that generates essentially the library that you need to interact with the thing, um, the, the, the web service. So, um, and not just in general, but that specific instance of it. Um, overall, obviously more effort, you're writing custom software um but it could be generic you can you can go for a generic one and go i want to write a custom graphql client uh, and use some of the graphql client libraries around there maybe as a starting point um, or you could do something that's customized and specific to your application um, and and again i think i said it already but you, you may address fuzzing within it you may not handle the fuzzing within your your thing and just use a looper or something um yeah yeah so that's kind of the oof, the five five approaches yep and we do a mix of those with every api test we do so yeah sometimes yeah. we just need one of them sometimes it depends on the api and how complex it is and yeah yeah i i don't know if anybody got here because of the um yeah, we did a blog and it was a, it had a little teaser for this before, but it's a, it's kind of just adjacent to this. But it was a it was a web test that because of the weird constraints of that particular one, I couldn't use the proxy for. Uh, and so I wrote a fuzzer in the in the JavaScript console of the browser, uh, and we got it done that way. Right? It's it's the well, if we got a problem, we're going to find a way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Move on. I guess we're running running a little bit low on time. So. Wow, and I thought it was going to be one of the shortest ones lately. <laughs> um, all right. So this is a quick kind of roundup of the general ecosystem for the the four kind of main services we talked about today. Now, again, the focus today wasn't these four services. The focus today was well, you come across a service you don't know what to do with. How do you work through it? How do you find your way? Um, I think everything here are things we've talked about. So it's just kind of a nice summary. There you go. Uh, Milkman shows up a lot there because it sounds like I'm really excited about Milkman. I, <laughs> it's also it's the not, new tool. <laughs> it, it's, 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 it's not that I'm really excited that it's doing something different. It's that it's, it, it seems to be filling a role that I needed filled. Um, so that we'll the, see how the, you feel about it after using it for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'll tell you, I don't, 
I don't like having to use SOAP UI. <laughs> yeah. I, know, I never go, yay, I get to use SOAP UI on this test. Um, it's, well, I guess I guess I need to use SOAP UI for this one. Okay. Yeah. I it take works. It out when it I use it. And it gets the job done. It gets the job done for me, but it's not my favorite. Um, and then like SOAP UI, I didn't put under RESTful because yeah, I never use it for that. Um, yeah. Anyway. We don't need to go through these bit by bit. We've kind of beaten Overall them references are here as well. Ah, uh, yeah. So hey, been throwing all these tools out there and stuff. If you want to grab a screen grab of one slide, this is probably the one of if you want the list yeah. of things I talked about. The list. Uh it's the the great big long. I think I got them all. <laughs> That's all the ones you mentioned. I see a couple on there that we did. Well, maybe one in there we did. I, I don't remember you mentioning Hopscotch. I've, oh, I've never yeah. seen it before, I, but I don't think I've said it out loud. Yeah. So Hopscotch, Hopscotch is a web. Uh, it can be self-hosted as well. Um, it, it's kind of a sort of a Swagger UI alternative, but it feels closer to Postman in terms of design. Yeah. Uh, but it, but in the browser, so. Another is browser based though. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And I, I guess uh, that wraps it up with um, we have a, a little bit of time for questions if anybody has any. I'd also say that if you're if you're working through any if you have any questions about this, or even if you're like working through your uh, your own testing later on and you're like, hey, uh, I can't remember which tool to use or what do you recommend for something because these change over time, um, then you can uh, we have the professionally evil. Um, Slack channel. So if you go to professionalevil.com, you'll find an invite there that should be active right now. Um, and you can jump in there and just um, throw a message. I think there's a, a web application or web pen testing channel or something in there, or you can just put it in the general channel. You do have yeah. Maybe you find other things that are good and work. I, I mean, I like know, knowing things. I like knowing about other options too. So I certainly would like to hear about what is working for everybody. And yes, Jeannie just posted the future webcasts link. Um, I know that that on the schedule right now, we have one um, on the 28th, minor flaws, cumulative risks, cyber insights. Um, this is the next one. I think that's that's in the, the works. So I'll be joining you again then. Did you know who's teaching that one? Uh, Josh and John. <laughs> oh, awesome. So, yeah. Yeah, should be good. All right. I don't I don't see any questions. So thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. And hopefully everybody learned a little something. And thanks, Mick, for presenting today. I know that you have a very busy schedule. It was hard to squeeze this in. So um, <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. All right.